Hello and welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast, Pressurized, a short, punchy version of our main feed that gets right to the scientific point. If you like what you hear and you'd like to hear the full episode, you can find it in the same feed. And now, to get right to the point. Right, we now know where eels breed, which was a bit of a mystery for a while. So there's still loads we don't know about even familiar species. And the European eel, Anguilla anguilla, are a sort of migratory fish. They live most of their life in fresh water, but they disappear off to sea when they're ready to spawn. So about 100 years ago, Johanna Smith proposed that they bred in the Sargasso Sea. And that was based on larval surveys, but no eggs or spawning adults have ever been sampled to confirm this. So 100 years of one of our key native species that is a food source and we still don't know quite how they breed. So 26 eels were given satellite tags and tracked on this journey, traveling all the way to the Sargasso Sea. They go deep and four of the eels lost their tags due to going over the depth rating of the tag, so going to over 1400 meters. So they are going deep when they reproduce despite being river fish for most of their lives. And there was a little local fun story with this. There's often eels in the Little Dove Aquarium up by where we used to live, Alan, in Scotland. Oh yeah. But they had a large eel in their tank they reach this really defined point where they're ready to reproduce they stop feeding all their teeth fall out they basically their body starts converting everything into reproductive material basically either eggs or sperm and at that point there's no saving the animal it is going to attempt to reproduce and then die so they took the roof off in order to get this huge eel out and used a crane and lifted it out and then it was uh, released into the sea to go and complete its journey to hopefully find love in the deep sea the other nice big paper actually from your lab alan about are the hadal zones isolated islands so study from friends of the show Johanna weston heather stewart yourself and a, a few members of your lab alan no they're not actually they're from newcastle oh, okay so this was work started back in newcastle so looking at the connectivity between hadal areas so areas beyond six thousand meters where we like to specialize the super deep parts using a cosmopolitan hadal amphipod so a species that was found pretty much globally bathycalosoma shellenbergi a little amphipod and looking at the genetic connectivity between these populations so looking at 12 isolated hadal features and what they found was that even though we consider this a single species there's very little gene flow between some of these populations and so they're effectively isolated in the hadal region and i love this term actually i don't know who came up with this they're on their own evolutionary trajectory who was it who coined that i quite like it that was me that sums it up because this sort of gives you interesting considerations on what we consider a species because once you when to get on the edge of what we consider a species there's actually a bit of a gray area and it's a bit of a judgment call one species becoming two can be a gradual process as new species develop so one actually within this group was already considered maybe a cryptic species in the atacama trench wasn't it yeah this is the problem i may have spoken about this before but the atacama trench is one of these ones where no matter what you do in the matter war trench you start to think that you've nailed this and you can see these interesting trends forming across tables and then you throw in the atacama trench data and it just ruins it <laughs> <laughs> They're so different from everywhere else. I'm still not entirely sure why. It's maybe something to do with oxygen, I reckon. But yeah, so those those bathycalosomas, there's a great graph in there. It's basically a genetic distance over a geographical distance, and it's fairly linear. So the further away they are, the, the more they're moving into being something else. But then the Atacama ones are just different, <laughs> as always. While we're in the Atacama Trench, we... I say we. I finally finished naming that species. So one of the three new species of hadal snailfish that we recorded uh, a while back in the Atacama Trench is... It now has a proper species designation. It's Paraliparus celti. It's a little blue fish, so we named it after the, the word for blue in the Kazu language of the people of Atacama. And yeah, it's a, it's a lovely little fish. And what is interesting about it, again, with Atacama constantly throwing us curveballs, is that it is a separate colonization of the deep sea, basically, of, of the Hadal trenches at least. So it's been revealed by genetic work more recently that the Hadal snailfish that we know about, that we have genetic sequences for, they all seem to have a common ancestry. So when we talk about how the snailfish are so well adapted to going super deep, you know, maybe it was one lineage, maybe it was one perfect storm, and it's sort of have only happened once. Uh, but this confirms this is the Paraliparus, which is a, a more modern genera. It's a more modern group, super abundant in around Antarctica. And it's a it's a whole new branch of the family tree going into the Hadal zone, going into the trenches. So it, it's a sort of lightning striking twice. It shows that there really is something special about the snailfishes that 
let them go deeper than other fish. And then on the back of your global abyssal and hadal fish paper, Alan, the three fish that we saw in the Atacama Trench look awfully similar to three that were recorded in the South Sandwich Trench in the Southern Ocean. It gets more complicated than that, because well, it's relatively believable that Celti is also the one in South Sandwich, but we've never caught them. So earlier this year, when we were talking before about the Diamantina Fracture Zone, and we pulled up those two fish from the deepest point of Australia, one of them is, honestly, it's identical to Celti. The only difference is it's 16,000 kilometres to the west of it. So if it's a subantarctic species, then it should be in Atacama and Diamantina. But between this episode and the next podcast, we will have the answers to that because it's being sequenced right now. Exciting. So that's a cool story. If that's the same one, then that's really yeah. cool. The other cool story is the second fish we caught in Diamantina is not the same as Celti and it's not the same as the normal Hadal ones. So there is definitely a third one. There's some sort of Hadal zone snailfish colonization going on from the Southern Hemisphere because we're not seeing these. But I think mm. in the amount of weird fishes we've seen in Hadal trenches that unfortunately we've only taken pictures of and we've not got a sample of, there's got to be more genera revealed, aren't they? I think those those sort of ethereal morphs, yeah. as we've been calling them, they're going to be something new as well. So there's still loads to pick apart with the mystery of the Hadal snailfishes and why they're just so good at it. We heard from one of our old students, Jackson Swan, and he's found himself in an interesting place. Well, he sent us an update on something unusual he's observed. Hey, my name is Jackson Swan. I'm a research scientist at the University of Washington and also a former student of Tom and Professor Jameson. So my current research involves me going to the Mekong River quite a bit. And some of the things that I've started to do on my time there has been to go up to the northern portion on the border between Cambodia and Laos to go study the deep pools. I was there in March of 2022 and decided one day to use, while doing an acoustic survey of the pools, to actually tie a camera to a dive weight and a dive flashlight kind of fashioned in the spirit of Tom and Alan's Hadal landers. Um, I used the echo sounder I was using to see where the fish actually were and decided to drop down the camera down to a depth of a whopping 75 meters. Now, in the grand scheme of things, this is like a puddle because it's not 7,500 meters, but for a river, I thought this was actually very, very deep. Considering the deepest portion of the Mekong I had found that previous year was only 60. Upon reviewing the footage that I pulled up from the bottom, I actually did manage to find some fish, largely what you'd call a pangaseous catfish, which is also called an iridescent shark. And another thing called a silurid catfish, which kind of almost looks like something you'd see in the deep sea with a flat head, large teeth, and a long fin, and a kind of like a macroid style tail. So actually, upon a further investigation, I kind of realized that these actually were the deepest fish ever recorded in the Mekong. They were also probably the only recordings of these fish in their natural habitat. So that was kind of cool. So this got me interested in this, and I did a little bit of digging, and there are rivers that go beyond 200 metres deep. So beyond the magic 200 metre line of depth that we consider the deep sea. Is there a word for this? Is there a deep river? So the person that immediately sort of sprang to mind is Dr. Melanie Stiasny. She is the Axelrod Research Curator and Curator in Charge of the Department of Ichthyology at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And her work focuses on the taxonomy, evolution and systematics of freshwater fish specifically in the Lower Congo River in Central Africa. And she knows a lot more about what we've observed here. I'm joined by Dr. Melanie Stiasny. Thanks so much for having a chat with us today, Melanie. Could you start by very broadly explaining your area of research? Sure, sure. I, I study freshwater systems, so I feel a bit of a fraud being on a deep sea podcast, but I've worked almost all of my career in Central Africa. And for the last 10 or so years, I've been working in the Congo Basin. So I've been concentrating on what's called the Lower Congo. So that's where the Congo River it falls off the high African plateau and plunges down to the Atlantic Ocean. So it's the tail end of the Congo river. That journey is about 300 kilometers, 350 kilometers. And over that stretch of the lower Congo, the river drops 280 meters in elevation. Now, it doesn't do it in one drop. It does it in series of drops. So what you have in the lower Congo is this whole stretch of rapids and then apparently still water and then another rapid and still water all the way down this final stretch of the Congo River. 
So we kind of knew that the lower Congo was a very interesting place for fish because of these rapids. There'd been one survey of the river in the 1970s, and they'd shown that there were a lot of fish species in the lower Congo. Um, we started our work in about, I think it was about 2006, and it's ancient history now, but we started and we found more and more species. So the lower Congo River is just 2% of the area of the basin. Yet in that 2%, we found over 30% of all of the fish is found in the Congo River itself. So it's an incredibly diverse place for fish. And we also found that nearly 30% of those fishes are only found in the lower Congo. So it's a real hot spot. Something's been happening there. Evolution's been going crazy there. And we always thought it was because of the rapids. Because what rapids can do to fish, if there's very fast flowing water, that can act as a barrier between populations of species that live above the rapid or below the rapid, and so forth, all the way down the river. So it really looked as if, and this is what a lot of our molecular studies have shown, it looks as if the rapids really have divided up fish populations along the lower Congo. And of course, once populations get divided, over time, they can diverge. And over time, you can get speciation occurring. That's one of the things that makes the lower Congo so extraordinary. And it's really extraordinary because this is happening at such a, such small scales. I mean, there are places where the distance from bank to bank is less than half a kilometre. In some places, it's less than a quarter of a kilometre. But where we've been able to sample fish specimens from either side of the banks, we found that even though the distance separating them was tiny, they might as well have been separated by a thousand miles. They're just not able to swim across from one side of the river to the other. Perhaps most pertinent for what we are going to be talking about today is the fact that we found incredibly deep holes and canyons in this part of the river, such that we really think this is the deepest river in the world. That's amazing. This sort of particular area of interest, it started like a good sci-fi novel. It started with a strange looking fish being washed up on the banks of the Congo, didn't it? The locals knew about it, but they never saw it alive. That's absolutely right. We knew the Lower Congo was extraordinary. We documented just tons more species than anyone thought were, were there originally. Very, very diverse. Lots of endemism, that is, lots of species only found in that lower stretch of the Lower Congo. And we thought it was due to rapids. Now, at certain points in our study, we were kind of picking up signals of cross-channel population divergence where there didn't seem to be any rapids. So that was kind of strange, so we weren't really sure what was going on. And then we were at a place called Bulu, which is about halfway down the lower Congo. And that's a place where one very strange fish had been found in that original expedition in the 1970s. They found one sample of this very odd cichlid fish that was completely blind and completely depigmented, looked very much like a cave fish. And I'd seen that specimen in the museum actually at Harvard, that one specimen that was caught in the 1970s. And that was all that was known about it. There was this fish at Bulu. We didn't know anything about how it was collected. Well, we went to Bulu and we went there a number of different times. And each time the local people would bring us specimens of this strange fish, but always dead. They found it entrained in, in little pools around the edges of the river. Never alive, always dead. And that's very, very mysterious. I mean, <laughs> we thought maybe there are caves somewhere and the caves are connected to the river and this cave fish is somehow dying and getting into the river. But that wasn't the case. There are no caves around that region. So we tried and tried to catch them alive. We never were able to. We caught all sorts of other fish at that place, but we never were able to catch this dead fish. And then one time we were there, one of the local villagers came to me with one of these fish, and it was just still alive. But as it died, air bubbles began to form under its skin, over its head, and over its gills. Now, it was clearly suffering from what we call catastrophic decompression syndrome. It's basically the fish's equivalent of the bends. Fish can get this if they suddenly come up from depth. Because we got there where one was just dying, we were able to see this phenomenon of its, its skin being filled with air and its gills being filled with air. And at that point, we suddenly were like, oh my God, could there be deep water here? That was really a bit of a, a wake-up moment because up until that point, we'd always thought of the Lower Congo as this turbulent series of rapids. A rapids is a shallow water phenomenon. But now we've got an animal that's apparently dying of decompression syndrome. So then the question arose, well, 
could there be deep water here? And finding that fish is really what set the whole thing off of us then trying to really measure what kind of depths there were in this last stretch of the Congo River. This feels like a, a good primer of a sci-fi book. You know, they, they find someone in the middle of a desert and he's drowned. Right. But studying deep sea fish, we certainly see the decompression sickness. Right, I would right. not be expecting to see that in something I'd found in a river. Exactly. To be honest with you, what we found in the lower Congo, these deep canyons, the water is so turbulent down there. And that's what makes it so different from the deep sea. The one place where we really studied it and we found depths of over 160 meters in a river, that's phenomenal. But the water Water down there is so turbulent that there's no way you could get down there. I mean, we got down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, right? Even though the canyons in the Congo are nothing like as steep as that, it, it would be virtually impossible to get down there. That's incredible. The difference between the turbulence and depth is, is kind of unheard of. I mean, there's depth in the sea, sure, but it's still and silent and, and calm down there. And that's absolutely not the case in the lower Congo. So even though there might be similarities about some of the things we're finding in these deep canyons in the lower Congo, it ain't like the sea at all, because it's just completely crazy in terms of water currents and plumes and recycling columns of water going up hundreds of meters. It's, it's really a cacophony down there. And also, it's only our assumption that the fish is living at depths in this region of Bulu, where we were using, in collaboration with a team from the U.S. Geological Survey and from my museum, the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, we got together and they deployed some really sophisticated equipment, it's acoustic Doppler current profilers. So using the ADCP along with echo sounders, we were able to measure not just the depth and the profile of the channel, but we were also able to visualize what the water's doing. So we could actually visualize the water currents. And finding that deep canyon, which, as I said, was over 160 meters deep at that point. There are other places that are even deeper. But that canyon at that point is where most of the dead cichlids. So the local name for this strange blind cichlid it's very odd. It's Mondelli Bureau. And Mondelli is Congolese for white. And Bureau is a corruption of Bureau in French office. So <laughs> for some reason, they're calling it the white man's office. I, I, I don't know. But anyway, yeah, it's really bizarre. But anyway, nearly all of the dead Mondelli Bureau that the local people were finding were around that canyon. And the fact that, you know, you only ever find it dead, the fact that it seems to be dying from decompression syndrome, we kind of made the assumption that it's got to be living down there, probably very close to the rocky bottom. The whole of the lower Congo is kind of rocky constrained. It's basically a, almost like a rift. So probably we assume that Mondelli Bureau is living down deep in the bottom of that canyon. And every now and again, it gets maybe swept up. It swims a little bit too high in the water and it gets swept into one of these jets of water that's just plunging from the depths right up to the top. If it gets entrained in that, it won't be able to swim against that current and it will pop up to the surface like a core with decompression syndrome. That's, that's our assumption. But then one interesting thing was that we started looking at the, not just the simple genetics of who's related to who, but looking at the genomics, what's controlling this strange blindness and the odd lack of pigment and all of the features about this very odd fish. So we started looking at its genome and comparing it with other cichlid genomes. And we came across some kind of interesting things, just very serendipitously. We were actually looking for what are the genes controlling the loss of eye or the loss of vision and depigmentation. But just coincidentally, we found that not only was this fish blind and depigmented, but we found clues in its genome that really did strongly suggest that we're right, that it must be living at depth. So, for example, we found that it had a whole series of what are called loss of function mutations, and it had a series of these in genes associated with repairing ultraviolet damage. Now, we're constantly repairing DNA damage from ultraviolet light, but this strange cichlid has lost the function in a lot of these ultraviolet repair gene mechanisms. 
So that's kind of interesting. It kind of suggests to me that it's living at depth is not exposed to any ultraviolet light whatsoever and therefore doesn't need to maintain all of these genes for ultraviolet damage repair to its DNA, which is quite costly to keep all of those genes. Yeah, so it, to me that kind of indicates that, yeah, this, this guy never sees any ultraviolet light. So that was one finding that we found looking at the genome. And then the other thing, which is, is really cool, that food availability is going to be very stochastic. We don't know what's down there. But we do know that if things could get swept down in some of these currents, maybe insect larvae or eggs or whatever. But it's not very common. It's going to be food is going to only be stochastically available. And what we found is that this Mondelli Villaro has also lost function in one of the genes, a gene called Spexin. So the down regulation or the loss of function in the Spexin gene results in the loss of appetite suppression. And that means binge eating. Wow. <laughs> so what this, yeah, it's really cool. So this gene spexin is also found in humans and it's downregulated in obese humans and obese rats, uh, they found, have downregulated it. Anyway, so the fact that it's lost the function of its spexin gene makes perfect sense if you're living in an environment where food is only sporadically available. And when that food's available, you binge eat and you binge eat and you binge eat and you store lots of, of fat lots of lipids when the food's there you eat it and you store it and then of course there's long periods of starvation and then more food becomes available so again the indication from the genome is that yeah we're right this animal really is living very deep in the canyon but as i say you know we can't prove it we can't actually go down there there's some deep sea sort of modes of life here that certainly the loss of vision uh, the loss of uv resistance and that that way of, of feeding we see that in a lot of our our deep sea scavengers things that will gorge themselves right it would be super cool to investigate whether the same is true in some of those deep sea fishes because we did a comparison with mexican blind kerosene a blind cave fish one of the interesting things is that we found when I started CT scanning some, some bodies of the Mondelli Bureau and some of these Astienax mexicanus, this Mexican blind cavefish. You can actually see all of these fat lipid globules in the heads of the <laughs> Mondelli Bureau, and you can see them in the heads of the cavefish. So they're doing the same thing. They're binge eating. But what's really interesting is it's a different gene in the um, Mexican cave tetra. It's a completely different gene. It's a, a mutation in the melanocortin 4 receptor, which is not spexin at all. So the point is, M Mondelli Bureau living at the bottom of a canyon, completely different habitat than the Mexican <laughs> blind cavefish living in still water in a cave. Cave, yet they're both doing the same thing because food is only sporadically available. The same conclusion in different ways. Exactly. It's the same morphology, you know, this sequestration of fat, but a completely different gene underlying it. So it's kind of, so it would be really cool for someone to do some genomics on some of these deep sea fishes to see how they're doing it or if they're doing it. That'd be incredible. We've got some great, great samples already. And I think we're just getting to the stage of full genome mapping. Yeah, there are absolutely parallels here. And that's why we went off piste a little bit to, to speak to both a cave biologist and, and yourself, because Right. There is convergent evolution. Just how you studied the, the blind cave fish, it informed the differences that you were seeing. And by us as deep sea biologists, talking to people who study caves and talk, talk to people who study deep freshwater fish, yeah. we can tease out the common narratives and it, it informs you so much more about evolution. Exactly. It's very exciting. No wonder you're so, uh, you're so sort of married to it. What a fantastic place to study fish evolution. It really is. It's been called, you know, evolution on steroids. <laughs> it really seems to be that. So I'm going to be doing it for a lot longer. And, and one of the things that's been so wonderful about working in the Congo is making these relationships with students and professors at the university in the University of Kinshasa and at the university in Brazzaville. A lot of my previous students who've worked with me on this project are now professors at those two universities. And it's just great to see them carrying on the work because that's one of the big things is that you need to be building in-country expertise so that these kind of studies and understanding the evolution and, and sustainability sustainable management of, of these fish resources is fundamentally so, so important. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Always happy to chat about my work. The truly passionate scientists are. Thanks so much, Bentley. We'll be in touch. Hello. 
This is oceanographer and explorer Don Walsh. Today's program will be on the different densities of the water in the oceans and how it affects activities there. The density of seawater is primarily affected by two items. One, the amount of dissolved salts in the water and its temperature. Adding salts makes, if you will, the seawater more dense. And warm water is lighter than cold water. So you have those two variables. The density of seawater affects the buoyancy of objects floating that seawater. To be non-scientific about it, the thicker the water the better buoyancy you have. And I offer as an example the Great Salt Lake in Utah where people can float very easily in that very thick water. Now consider the case of a military submarine operating the sea. Ideally, a submarine which displaces thousands of tons of seawater must be as neutrally buoyant as possible. That is, not too heavy so it sinks or not too light so it floats up to the top neutral buoyancy, and that's achieved by using various tanks inside the submarine to add water for weight or to get rid of water to get rid of weight. Now consider if you're operating near an area where there's a lot of input of fresh water into the ocean, and therefore you have a change of density in that immediate area. Because what will happen is you will suddenly get heavy and uh, you have to work pretty hard to uh, regain neutral buoyancy. Uh, You're not going to crash or anything like that, but an unalert watch on a submarine can find themselves very much surprised when a situation like this happens. But the other thing to keep in mind is that fresh water, understandably, floats on top of salty water. Being less dense, it forms a lens on the surface of the ocean so that the further away you get from the source, like a river outlet, the less fresh water you're going to have at any given depth in the ocean. However, a really important factor in the changes in seawater density is in the propagation of sound because the more dense a substance is, the faster sound travels. For submariners, it's a matter of life and death to be able to hear what's around them and at the same time be as quiet as possible. If uh, the density of seawater was uniform from the sea surface to uh, the sea floor, then all of this would be easily predicted through standardized charts and tables. However, this is not the case. So this means that the submarine itself must have an onboard capability of measuring sound velocity in order to be as sneaky as possible. And you do this as frequently as possible to stay aware of the acoustic situation around your ship. During my 14 years in submarines, including a couple of years as the captain of one, I was able to position my submarine almost right next to a surface ship who had his sonar pinging away so loudly that we could actually hear it through the hull of the submarine. And in other cases, you think you're safe because you're several miles from that ship and he can hear you as if you're just next door. And this means you have to be constantly aware of changes in the sound velocity in your immediate vicinity. And the way to do this, either to your benefit, is to move up and down in the water column and then checking the variability of uh, sound or the density of the water throughout the water column to get close to the bad guys or just remain hidden so he can't hear you. And although it's been 50 years since I last operated in submarines, these principles still apply today to modern nuclear submarines of all navies. That is, hear and not be heard. Well, that's uh, all I've got for now, and thank you for listening. And that concludes this pressurized version of the Deep Sea Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode and you'd like to go into some more detail, you can find the full episode in the feed. Just match the episode numbers. We'll deep see you next time, and I abyss you already. The Deep Sea Podcast is supported by our company, Amatus Oceanic. If you'd like to explore the deep sea for yourself, we can provide the technology and know-how to allow you to do that. Or if you'd like to bring the deep sea to your audience through storytelling, fact-checking, or presentations, we can help with that as well. We want the deep sea to be accessible to everyone.